you know, what's interesting about Asia is how poor Asia was very, very recently. Um, you know, Asia is a, uh, Eastern Asia is a place that up until certainly, uh, it, so if you think about it, uh, coming out of World War II, uh, China went communist via Mao and, and kind of uh, solidified its, its poverty, at least until the 1980s. Uh, Japan was basically flattened. It was completely destroyed. And people don't know this, but, you know, before Hiroshima and Nagasaki, every single major Japanese city had been firebombed. Uh, in, 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 in Tokyo, there were at least a million uh, people who were homeless. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese industrial base, the Japanese economy was completely destroyed. It, when you go today to Tokyo, almost every building that you see, not every building, but almost every building that you see was built after World War II. Uh, there are a few places, certainly the, 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 um, the, the, the um, Empress Palace and the, the Imperial area, which was preserved purposefully by the Americans. But pretty much the rest of Tokyo was flattened, as were every single major city in Japan. So Japan had nothing at the end of World War II. Korea, of course, had, had, had always been a poor place. It had been colonized by the Japanese and, and uh, made a part of the Japanese Empire in 1910. And had uh, then after World War II, when it achieved its it, it was independence, it kind of was split into two, a northern part which was controlled by the Soviet Union, a southern part that was controlled by uh, the, 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 the West or, or by the U.S. And, uh, you know, ultimately that led to a war in 1950 when the North Koreans invaded South Korea, uh, a war that lasted three years, a war that completely devastated the Korean Peninsula. So Korea, South Korea, which was poorer than North Korea at the end of the war, it was again completely devastated. There was nothing there. Nothing. I mean, these were some of the poorest people on planet Earth were living in, in, in Korea. Japan less so, because Japan, of course, had had a, a real civilization and an industrialized and in many respects westernized, but it had been destroyed. It had nothing. And then if you go to Taiwan, which was a, a brand new country, if you will, of refugees from mainland China uh, and, and ruled by an authoritarian, again, devastatingly poor, uh, Hong Kong, I've often described as a fishing village. I mean, that you'd have to go further back for it to be a fishing village. But by the end of World War II, it was still a very small place ruled by the British. Singapore was nothing. I mean, the whole area was, I mean, Asia Asia was synonymous with, with adjunct poverty, was, with, 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 with harvest of poverty. And yet all these countries, in a matter of, 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 70, 80 years, but really in a shorter matter, we'll get to that in a minute, have achieved fantastic levels of wealth as compared to most of the rest of the world, uh, have definitely achieved levels of wealth comparable to Europe, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, have today, Korea has, Korea and Japan have some of the highest uh, life expectancies in the world. Uh, they, they, it's stunning. It's stunning to visit a, a city like Seoul and see just the level of development, the amount of development in, in, in Tokyo is just amazing. I mean, Tokyo has no one downtown. They have several downtowns, skyscrapers everywhere, uh, office buildings, uh, condo, beautiful condo buildings, just a, just a whole array of, of construction that is, that is uh, relatively modern. And if you think about it, for both Japan and, and the rest, Japan, of course, um, coming out of World War II, uh, immediately uh, uh, re-industrialized, uh, you know, it, it, they unleashed by unleashing freedom in Japan um, and taking uh, the, entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial spirit that the Japanese, I think, to some extent, have, have had for a long time and, uh, and allowing for political freedom. Japan just started flourishing right out of the gate and uh, started building what today are these, you know, some of the greatest corporations in, in history, you know, Honda and Toyota and uh, Mitsubishi and, and, uh, and on and on and on, you know, these massive 
uh, successful businesses that were created during the 19, many of them were created during the 1950s and then flourished during the 1960s, primarily originally by both copying American designs, but also innovating on American designs and making them more efficient and making them more productive. So that by the 1970s, um, uh, Japan was kicking American butt in terms, of, uh, in terms of automobiles, in terms of TVs, in terms of VCRs, video players, uh, in terms of almost every uh, enterprise. Japan was on a roll. Uh, steel production. Um, and, and that really lasted into 1980. So Japan, from 1945 until 1989, achieved unprecedented economic growth, uh, just stunning uh, amounts of um, um, stunning amounts of, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, wealth creation and production and efficiency and innovation and uh, cameras. Yes, Thomas says cameras as well. Absolutely. And, and of course, Sony, I don't know, how did I not mention Sony? One of the most innovative companies for many, many decades in the world. And, you know, it's just, it's just stunning to, to, to visit um, Tokyo and to realize how much of that, uh, you know, uh, and, and of course, I think they would be, they could have been even more uh, successful and competitive if not for some of the protectionist policies of the United States, which, which sustained a, an auto industry in the United States that really probably shouldn't exist. Um, but uh, the Japanese, uh, that Japanese model of growth um, and economic prosperity and, and, and wealth creation uh, sustained itself until 1989. And again, the Japanese economy grew at unprecedented rates uh, during that time. So it, it took it, what, 40, 44 years to... to attain uh, just a, a, an almost a Western-like level of economic prosperity. And then if you look at Korea, Korea didn't start really developing until maybe the 70s, really the 80s. Korea did not become a politically free place until I think 1987 um, when, uh, when uh, presidents were finally elected. Uh, and it is it is just exploded in terms of economic growth. And again, uh, you know that period of about forty years, forty years has sustained massive economic growth uh, in Korea. And today, Samsung and Kia, and the, uh, you know, and Samsung both in in electronics, Kia and Hyundai in automobiles, but uh, but in many other industries, uh, Korea has become a dominant player. And again, the the quality of life, the standard of living, the um, uh, the wealth creation in Korea is is truly stunning, and Korea, of course, was joined in that by Taiwan and by Hong Kong and by Singapore, the Asian Tigers, uh, and all of that in a span of 40, 50 years, they attained the same wealth levels as the United States. So it's it's truly stunning the the energy, the hard work, the work ethic, the the entrepreneurship that at least some uh, within these societies have. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the success that all these economies attained so quickly is uh, fantastic. And, and it's not just economic success. They, they, these countries, you know, Taiwan was a dictatorship for a long time, and it is today a free country, a uh, free politically. Uh, Singapore is still, you know, this mixture of a lot of freedom and, 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 and a lot of authoritarianism. Hong Kong, unfortunately, has been taken over by China. But North, uh, South Korea... Uh, uh, Japan and, um, and and Taiwan remain free countries, remain countries uh, with with uh, amazing, uh, amazing, uh, amazing quantities of wealth and, and amazing uh, amazing standard of quality, uh, standard of living and quality of life. And the other thing about Japan and Korea, and I don't know if this is true of Taiwan, but certainly of Japan and Korea, is that they are both just unbelievably safe. I mean, a number of people have told me you could leave anything. You could leave your computer, you could leave your phone, you could, and you could walk away and for hours and come back and it'll still be there. Um, people don't steal stuff. Violent crime in Japan and Korea is, is almost non-existent. It is, it, is some of the, it, it is, I think, the safest places on planet Earth in terms of violent crime. So the quality of life, if, if, if you consider the, the toll that the crime and generally and violent crime take on people, uh, if you take that onto account into the quality of life, the quality of life here is very high um, and, uh, and uh, inspiring.
uh, I mean, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could live anyway um, and, uh, and ha- be able to not worry about, uh, about crime, particularly this is kind of in your face at a time where violent crime in the United States is, is increasing, uh, increasing substantially. So uh, that's kind of the history, a little bit of the history, economic history in terms of development. Japan hit a wall in 1989. Its stock market collapsed. It, 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 it had created during the 1980s while there was real production and real wealth creation. They had also created this massive bubble uh, because of government intervention, because of the behavior of the Japanese central bank, a bubble in real estate and a bubble in the stock market, a bubble in real estate and stock market like we'd never seen, I don't think, anywhere in the world ever. Um, the stock market really hasn't, I don't think, recovered its levels from back then, even today. Uh, so uh, there was a massive collapse. Since 1989, the Japanese economy has been growing, but growing very tepidly, very slowly. Troy, thank you for the support. Really appreciate the 500 Australian dollars. That is fantastic. Thank you. Um, so the, the Japanese economy has been growing at 1% a year sometimes less, sometimes a little more, but, but not significantly, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a shame. I think standard of living, quality of life have risen um, in, in uh, you know, with, with the rise of technology and the improvement of technology. I don't think GDP, as we've talked about many times on the show, GDP doesn't really capture the true growth rate, if you will, the true progress that is being made, uh, but it does capture something. So uh, the Japanese economy has hit a wall. The Korean economy, uh, I'd say during the financial crisis, uh, hit a somewhat wall. And again, uh, growth in Korea has been quite tepid over the last uh, decade or so uh, with very little signs of of dramatic recovery. Uh, Again, COVID has really taken uh, a toll, I think, on on all the economies uh, of Eastern Asia. Uh, And uh, I don't know about Taiwan. I know less about the economy of Taiwan. I haven't visited Taiwan, but... uh, the uh, uh, the uh, there is this dramatic economic slowdown. So there is a, an Asian economic development model, which is to free up the economy somewhat, the government to control uh, uh, the banking sector and and to incentivize exports over imports. Uh, that worked in Japan. It worked in Korea. But in all those cases, that limited level of economic freedom and that government involvement, particularly in banking and particularly in the government, in cronyism, in the government preferring certain businesses and, 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 and particularly preferring large businesses, uh, that uh, uh, halts, limits the, the, the level of growth and, and the level of sustained economic growth that is possible uh, in these economies. And, and that certainly happened during the, at the end of the 1980s in Japan, if you think about the Japanese model, you had uh, the government controlling the banks, the banks then very involved in businesses, the government basically telling banks which businesses uh, should be supported and which not, but generally the, uh, the, the government uh, encouraging the banks never to allow for bankruptcy. So bankruptcy happens in Japan, but it is relatively rare. Um, Japanese banks prop up uh, Japanese businesses supported by uh, the Japanese uh, government. The same, to some extent, happens in Korea. Um, and you have these models of very, very, very diversified businesses that are in every single business possible. Uh, in in Korea, um, in Korea, Samsung is in everything. It builds cars. It, it it builds obviously TVs and electronics and phones and things like that. But it also owns. Uh, I think uh, uh, real estate and it, it it's in every business possible, uh, steel and other things. So uh, and that is the model. The model is to build these massive conglomerates, even though it's been proven over and over and again that it's not an efficient economic model. That is the model that the Asians have adopted to build these massive um, conglomerates, and then for those conglomerates to basically be protected from competition by government and to be uh, to to. Uh, be encouraged to, uh, to primarily export. That business model, that governance model can work uh, up to a point. And I think there's no question Japan hit that point in uh, the early 1990s. Korea probably hit that point about 10 years ago. Taiwan has hit that point. 
although Taiwan, I, I, I suspect, has a free economy in, in many respects than um, uh, South Korea or, uh, or Japan. So, uh, uh, you know, all of these economies are now just uh, floundering. They're, they're kind of slow growth. They're kind of just holding their own. But they're not growing. They're not creating wealth. They're not increasing quality of life and standard of living in any way close to the rates, A, that they're capable of, and B, uh, that I think they that that they have generated in the past, and as a consequence, there's a certain sense of stagnation. There's a certain sense of pessimism. There's a certain sense of 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 this is it. We've reached. We've peaked. We, we we're not going to get any better than this. Uh, you know, add to that what I definitely sense across this entire region is real fear and a rising fear of China. Uh, we talked a lot about China, so I'm not going to go through the Chinese history, but China. Has also hit a growth barrier. Uh, China has turned into much more authoritarian, much more statist, and much more um, and much less economic growth and economic prosperity. So uh, China is 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 struggling. Uh, China is struggling with COVID. China is struggling with economic growth. China is struggling in every dimension. And a lot of these countries here are looking at Russia and seeing what happened to Russia when it struggled how it started diverting attention overseas and how it became much more aggressive in its overseas plans. And they're really afraid. They're really afraid of Chinese aggression. They're really afraid of Chinese aggression against Taiwan. But if, if, if the Chinese aggress against Taiwan, that gives them a lot of control over the, the, the sea lanes uh, that are necessary for both Korea and Japan in terms of trade. Uh, it gives them control over much of the, uh, uh, the, the, this part of the Pacific. Um, if they go to Taiwan, I think particularly in Japan, but I think also in Korea, what is to stop them uh, from going to, um, uh, from expanding into Japan? There's also a lot of angst. Can the Koreans and the Japanese trust the Americans? Um, I think they're, they're a little encouraged by the support that uh, the United States is providing Ukraine, but uh, post-Trump administration, they're not convinced that that support will be there in the future. Uh, now, I for one don't think they should get that support. I, you know, they should not get American direct military support. I think we should leave Korea. We should leave Japan. Um, but what do they do then? Uh, so there's real discussion in Japan about changing its constitution. Its constitution written by MacArthur um, limits the scale of the Japanese military. Uh, makes it a defensive force and and uh, and limits the the scale and scope of it. While Japan has one of the best navies in the world today, it doesn't have much of a military beyond that. Of course, it doesn't have nuclear weapons, um, and and the Japanese are now talking about changing that constitution in order to build up a military. I think the South Koreans, I would encourage them if they're not already thinking about doing this, is is significantly increasing the amount of spending they have on military so as to reduce their dependence on the United States and ultimately to be in a position that when the United States leave Korea, which I think is inevitable at some point, that they can uh, defend, themselves, defend themselves not only against the North Korean threat, but also ultimately against China. I think both Japan and Korea are well positioned to fight China. I think they are quite competent and quite able. They're more technologically advanced than China is. Uh, they are smaller in terms of population and smaller in terms of total wealth, but they are free. And as we can see in Ukraine, free countries have an enormous advantage over authoritarian governments. And I think both these countries should be investing heavily in their militaries um, uh, to, to face off, to face the, the, the potential Chinese threat in the future. And I, for one, don't think China, I think China's learning lessons from Russia. And one of the lessons is, you know, beware <laughs> about these invasions. They don't quite happen as easily and as quickly as you might think they will. Uh, I think if if Russia is defeated in Ukraine, which I think will ultimately happen, um, China will be very hesitant to go after Taiwan. I think the other thing that, 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 that the war in Ukraine has done is that it's, it's at least given an indication that the West can uh, have a united front and, and support in supporting Ukraine and maybe in supporting Taiwan if it came to that. Uh, so I don't think China's going to be uh, aggressive anytime soon. I don't think they can afford to be. I think they've got too many internal problems right now. Uh, but it is a real threat uh, to these countries. 
Of course, what Japan and, and, and South Korea re really need is they really need a, uh, a boost to their economic prospects, a boost to their economic growth. And they really need to find ways to break um, a, uh, a, a, a system that encourages conformity because at whatever level the conformity is, level of masks or, or level of opinions about certain things, level of fear, that conformity spills over into life. And that means conformity means less entrepreneurs. It means less innovation, less inge in ingenuity. It means less progress. And it means a duller, uh, more boring, simpler uh, life, culture. Uh, what both countries need is uh, to reinvigorate uh, the individualistic spirit that got them to where they are. Now, it was never, it was never totally, um, it was never totally individualistic. But whatever allowed for the great economic progress was the individualism of some people, thinking for themselves, innovating, creating, building, organizing. That takes real thought, real effort, and real individualism. So what these countries need to do is both break a, a culture of conformism, break a cycle of fear, and I think you can see that with COVID is, is the fear, uh, which is debilitating, and encourage, you know, or, or, or at least get out of the way to sustain economic growth, and all those things are tied together. So like everywhere, uh, I would say that the first the first thing you have to reform, the first reform you should engage in is educational reform. It's the educational, it's the schools where conformity is encouraged, conformity is taught, uh, conformity is sustained. Uh, now, again, I think Japan in particular has made a lot of strides away from that conformity, uh, but I'm disheartened by the mask wearing in Japan right now. Um, and, and, and the extent to which that is, uh, that is prevalent. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, Japan has such potential. It, there's so much beauty in Japanese culture, uh, in, in the design, in the attention to detail, in the, the caring about aesthetics, caring about beauty. I mean, I've talked a lot about on the show, right, about create your own space, make it beautiful. And the Japanese are very good at that. And, and Japanese culture very much emphasizes that and, and draws on that. I mean, some of the most beautiful hotel rooms I've stayed in in the world have been, certainly in Asia. Asia has the best hotel rooms in the world. But 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 many of them have been in Japan. I mean, the hotel I stayed at uh, just now in Japan was fantastic. I mean, the room was gorgeous. It was beautiful. It was just the, the little aesthetic touches and and just the, the, the combination of modern with certain level of kind of Japanese aesthetic. It just, just, Fantastic. So um, what we need in all over the world, and, and, and certainly what Japan and Korea need, is they need educational reform. And the best way to achieve educational reform is by privatizing education, by creating some kind of system of, of vouchers or education saving accounts or some kind of way in which the Japanese can, um, uh, can liberate entrepreneurship, liberate innovation in education, uh, bring Montessori to Japan and Korea um, and, uh, and, and, and encourage, a, uh, encourage competition. And, and, and let's, see, uh, let's see how we can uh, foster both knowledge, knowledge and thinking skills, as well as individualism, as well as initiative, as well as you know, entrepreneurial thinking ingenuous thinking so um, it's um, it's what we all need everywhere and I think more than anybody the Japanese and the Koreans need and then of course they need to get rid of the system of cronyism they need uh, the government to step back from uh, in a sense running the banking system again we in the United States need the same thing but it's, it's worse here uh, they need to uh, allow for real competition. You know, there's no Uber, really, um, here. And, and, and the reason is, again, to protect the taxi drivers. They need to allow for, for real competition. They need to allow uh, new entrants to, uh, uh, to challenge 
um, to challenge the, uh, the the large businesses, the large corporations, the diversification. They need to allow financial innovation to allow the breakup of, of some of these conglomerates. Conglomerates are not healthy businesses. They're not efficient. They're not productive. Uh, they would run a lot better as individual companies focused on different things rather than one entity focused on everything. Uh, focus is important in life, in every aspect of life, including in business. So uh, uh, there are some basic, simple reforms that these countries have to engage in if they would like, if they want to continue their economic progress, if they want to continue their economic growth um, and, and continue their path towards, you know, they've got such a great foundation of a, a society with no crime, a society with huge level of trust, a society that is uh, w w hard workers, um, uh, people who value education, they've got the basics. And, uh, what, you know, they've got the basics at some level. But then what they need is the, the underlying, the, the, and they've got the beginnings of this individualism. I mean, you can see it in, in, in the fact that they want to be, they, they're trying, they're making an effort in, in the way they dress and in the way they, you know, in the things they like and, and they're passionate and they have emotions. You can see that in the Korean dramas and they value us and you can see, you definitely see it in Japan as well and all the things that they enjoy and they love and they like. And they've got the basics of individualism and what they need now is the intellectual foundations of it and they need now is an economic freedom to allow that to translate into real, dramatic, significant, sustainable economic progress. And I think all of that is possible. And all of that uh, can, can happen. Uh, you know, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that there is an active objectors group in Japan and the books are being translated. I'm encouraged by, by the fact that there are uh, objectivists here in, uh, in Korea, although it seems at least like most of the co objectivists in Korea are American expats. But the books are in Korea, and there is definitely a free market movement in Korea. That's why I've been invited to this conference. I wouldn't have been invited otherwise. So uh, there's definitely forces trying to bring about these changes in both Japan uh, and Korea. And of course, I think both countries need to build up their militaries uh, to provide them with a kind of uh, defense and provide do it now um, before you've got your back against the wall with, with, a, with a more aggressive China. If you build up your military now, maybe you'll discourage China for ev from ever engaging in, um, in uh, military adventurism, uh, as they, they sometimes call it. Um, all right. Um, one other aspect I want to talk about that I think is important for both cultures, both the Japanese and the Korean culture, certainly, but it's also a problem in China and a problem in much uh, of Eastern Asia, and that is dramatically declining birth rates. I think that Korea has the lowest birth rates in the world. They're well under one. Uh, so I think it's 0.85, something like that. Um, that is population collapse kind of levels. Uh, that is real decline. Um, and it would be, it, 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 it is kind of sad. Uh, and it is reflective of the fact that I think that there is real angst, uh, you know, like I say in, in Japan, I think it's 1.2, so it's a little higher than, um, than, um, uh, than Korea, but remember that replacement is just over two, 2.1, I think. So uh, you need 2.1 uh, for, for replacement, both Japan and Korea are way, way below that, so they're both shrinking populations, very old, much older populations, so what you're getting now is the real injustice of older people, massive numbers of old people retiring and placing, and because of the government pension system, because of the government support healthcare system, putting a massive, massive financial burden, just a massive financial burden on uh, younger generations. So you've got a, a, a huge and growing uh, transfer of wealth from young Asians to old Asians. Um, this is bad in the United States now with the baby boomers retiring. But this is even worse here, partially, uh, you know, uh, uh, much worse here, partially because this population is, they have fewer young people to share the burden, right? That's also a, a real drag in economic activity and w another reason why just from a purely economic perspective, they have to liberalize the economies if they want to keep up and if they want to be able to sustain their quality of life and standard of living. 
uh, as the population decreases. But also, I am a strong believer that if these countries boost their military spending and they gain a certain confidence in uh, their sustainability, in their ability to resist Chinese aggression, in their ability to, to sustain themselves long term, if they liberalize their economies and increase, uh, and increase the prospects for economic growth, uh, people start get feeling like they can get richer, they can create more wealth, they can sustain themselves economically. Uh, I think if you get that, and on top of that, um, uh, you know, you, you, you gain uh, that sense of individualism, that sense that their life is their own and, and their pursuit of happiness is okay, which I think you have in Asia. Uh, I think birth rates will go up. I think uh, these things are not deterministic. I don't think populations have to collapse. I don't think population growth, uh, population has to go to be below one. I think that populations can recover and what you need to recover is a belief in the future. What you need is that sense of optimism. What you need is that sense of confidence in the sustainability of your culture, your sustainability of your country. And uh, the, 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 the prospects for a better, freer, more successful future than, uh, than the present. So um, I, I think these economies, I, I think these cultures can recover from very, very low birth rates, but only, only if they, uh, if they adopt a more positive, optimistic uh, view. And, and, and both Japan and South Korea desperately need this uh, because if you go to somebody, uh, Kodaba says a Japanese fertility rate is 1.37. I think that's up a little bit. Um, but yes, 1.37 is still very, very low. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, Russia's in the same ballpark. Italy's in the same ballpark. Spain is in the same ballpark. Much of Europe is in the same ballpark. Um, and and it, it is, uh, uh, I think, devastating to the future, uh, given the burden that we have placed on young people to support old people. And, you know, maybe... Maybe that'll be part of the spur towards more individualism. And maybe there will be a rebellion of the young against, um, uh, you know, re rebellion of the young against uh, uh, this massive redistribution of wealth and, and a rebellion of the young in favor of more freedom and more liberty from an economic perspective. So I think, again, both countries have hope in that respect. And then finally, uh, the other aspect of the demographics is both countries need immigrants. Uh, both countries uh, need immigrants, should allow for immigration. Uh, I think both countries have strong cultures that would allow for assimilating those immigrants. I think you see that to the extent that you uh, see immigrants in, uh, uh, in Japan and Korea. They love it here. They enjoy it here. They assimilate. They adopt the culture. They adopt many of, of, of the cultural norms. Um, but, you know, if they are going to if they are going to um, uh, be successful, if they are going to go uh, to grow, if they are going to be innovative, dynamic cultures, then um, they should allow for uh, for immigration. There are plenty of people uh, in Asia who would love to who would love to come to uh, where, where it would be relatively cheap for them to move to Japan or to uh, or to Korea, whether it's from a place like Cambodia and Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia. There's no shortage of relatively poor, poorer countries than, uh, than Japan and Korea who would like to come here. Many of them would just like to come and work and, and, and go back home um, after they make some money. Some of them would like to integrate into the uh, J Japanese or Korean cultures. So uh, no question. Whether they like it or not, that is the solution. You know, a, a 0.85 uh, birth rate will ultimately lead South Korea to become this tiny little country of insignificance, to be sweeped away by history, by some other culture that will dominate it. Um, much better to bring in, uh, to, to allow for immigration and to allow for large-scale immigration while you are strong, while you have a culture that you can, um, uh, you know, assimilate people into. So um, hopefully that will happen. Uh, it's already starting in Japan, the, 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 the slowly opening up um, uh, paths for foreigners to come into the country and uh, they're dramatically expand or they have dramatically expanded 
the um, uh, the opportunities for people to come and work in Japan. They just they don't have enough people working. It's just the reality of it. So uh, they need more young people. Uh, they need more young people partially so that they can subsidize all the old people. And uh, both countries realize that, and both countries, I think, certainly Japan has already started on the process of importing. Uh, of uh, of uh, increasing Im uh, Im immigrants, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Korea followed suit. All right. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Your Own Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and of course subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.